La 100 de ani de Republică Seculară, Turcia, creată de Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, va trece prin alegeri prezidențiale de o importanță istorică. Rece Perdoan, care conduce țara de 20 de ani, a fost pe rând premier și șef de stat, are un contracandidat puternic în persoana lui Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, un politician discret care a reușit însă să unească partidele de opoziție. Întreaga lume este atentă la aceste alegeri pentru că de ele depinde cursul unei țări importante atât pentru vest și alianțele democrate, cât și pentru est și politicile autocrate. Mehmet Ogutsu a lucrat în diplomația Turciei și face o analiză completă a posibilelor rezultate ale votului pe care turcii îl vor da pe 14 mai. Sunt Cristina Cileacu, începe pașaport diplomatic. Mehmet Ogutsu, president of the London Energy Club, welcome to diplomatic passport. My pleasure. Mr. Ogutsu, uh, on the 14th of May there will be presidential elections in Turkey and the entire world is watching the presidential election in Turkey because these are important not for your country only but also for the rest of us. Why is that? Well, because it's going to matter significantly for Turkey because it's going to decide whether the backsliding of democracy will continue or heavy intervention in the economy and foreign policy, of course, ventures and the economic mismanagement and call out from a devastating earthquake that we experience in Turkey. There are many, many internal problems to deal with. Therefore, I think the primary focus of whoever is going to win the election will be the domestic uh, challenges to heal, especially the wounds to heal. However, it's going to have, as you say, a significant impact on Turkey's relations with the EU, with the NATO, the United States, Turkey's role in Russia's war in Ukraine, tensions in Ismet, and also uh, what's happening with Greece, Syria, focuses. So wherever you turn around Turkey, there are problems, trouble spots. And therefore, Turkey is either part of the problem in this geography, or a party which can help resolve the problems. Therefore, the whole world will be watching this historic election. I'm saying historic because whoever is going to win, I think will have significant um, a recalibration of its economic and foreign policy options. Well, let's talk first about the main uh, candidates for the job of the president of uh, Turkey. First is Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. It's um, the uh, leader of the opposition, but uh, he's also called the Gandhi of Turkey um, because he's very humble and as well he is also um, campaigning in a different way. He's, he's doing his campaign from his uh, literally kitchen. He promised that Turkey will follow the same uh, path that uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk started 100 years ago. Is this possible? Well, if he wins the election, there is still the, I think, uh, if. Yeah. Because uh, some people in Turkey are so relaxed to think that Erdogan will lose and opposition will win. And still, Erdogan is not showing any sign of weakness and neither opposition is showing that they are ahead of Erdogan in a significant way. Plus, we have two other candidates which emerge uh, in the election ballots. One is Muharrem Ince, he is a former CHP presidential candidate, mm -hmm. and he has a personal vendetta with CHP. And they think also he's somehow secretly behind the doors aligned with Erdogan. Then there is also a young ac academic called Sinan Ogan, He comes from the nationalist uh, movement, and, but they might cut back uh, Lipsterolo's chance of uh, overwhelming majority in the first round. If the election moves to the second round, I think there will be some question marks on who can win and who can lose there. But Lipsterolo, the direct answer to your question, is a quite, quite honest and, as you say, the Gandhi-style man. And he managed to bring together seven parties, table of six plus 
somehow HDP, the pro-Kurdish uh, party, they also promised to support him against Erdogan. And it was a very delicate, delicate act bringing them together because all the others were Islamists, nationalists, and conservative liberal parties. He managed to bring them all together in an alliance against Erdogan. But the difficulty is these parties have little in common besides the desire to get rid of Erdogan. So if they win the election, there won't be a strong charismatic leader at the head of it, because as you said, he's a Gandhi-style leader trying to achieve consensus, but it's not easy between seven parties to achieve consensus. Then he has to put together a very strong execution team among all these parties. So he has a very hard task let alone Turkey's challenges. You know, the economy is in deep trouble. There is no fresh money coming into the economy, neither as foreign direct investment, nor portfolio or credits. And Turkish risk is very high in international capital markets. And plus uh, this earthquake, unfortunate earthquake we experience, will have a bill of at least $100 billion in addition. And uh, so, Whoever wins the election will have to make significant changes in economy and the democratic credentials of Turkey, heavily criticized at home and abroad, and then recalibrate the foreign policy. They already started doing this under Erdogan. As you remember, you know, Turkey's rapprochement now with Egypt, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, UAE, Israel. This was unthinkable a couple of years ago. And also with Greece, some sort of entente has been achieved. Turkey follows also a delicate line between Russia and Ukraine and the Western sanctions. So this requires quite a skillful diplomacy. And we shouldn't perhaps dismiss all what Erdogan and his team are doing, although much remains to be desired in many regards. But Mr. Olu definitely is a leader for the transitional period. So if he wins this election with support from other opposition parties, I think that this will be the first step towards a democratic or stop the backsliding of democracy in Turkey in a way. Or then open a new chapter in this regard. If they don't make a major mistake, it is possible that uh, Kılıçdaroğlu and his allies will be winning at least the presidential election. If not, I think we are going to have a serious uh, situation ahead of Turkey and I don't know how it can be handled under a new government led by Erdogan. If Erdogan will remain uh, the president of Turkey after these elections, what he did well for Turkey is the fact that he literally raised the um, standard of living of the Turkish people, at least when he was prime minister. What he does less, um, let's say, accepted is the fact that he wants to bring back religion in the political life of, uh, of Turkey. Is winning of Erdogan uh, as a remaining president of uh, Turkey going to be followed by a different reform to what Atatürk had? Atatürk in almost 15 years, he achieved a major transformation of Turkey uh, from the ashes of the Ottoman Empire collapsed. And so his revolutions, his reforms, uh, today unthinkable in any country in such a short space of time. Whereas Erdogan has been in power for 20 years, I think he has done good things in the first two terms. He led the country. I think we should be fair to him in terms of economy, democracy, EU accession, foreign policy. However, I think after the end of the second term, we see a different Erdogan than the coup attempt, of course, made life more difficult for him. And now, if he gets elected again, uh, at this election, historic election, and definitely he has to change his mindset, which is very difficult. He has to change his team. And there are talks that he might be bringing back uh, Mehmet Şimşek from London, the former the Minister former of, of Finance, finance yeah. uh, putting him in charge of economy because he has respectability and credibility in the international arena. And Probably he negotiated that Erdogan will not intervene in his strategy because Erdogan is against totally interest rate hikes, 
and free market economy somehow. He has deep in intervention in economy and more personal lifestyle rather than depending on the economics uh, of supply, demand, and other factors. Therefore, Erdogan has to have a new economic team in place, a new foreign policy team uh, who can inspire confidence in, among the neighbors as well as the international community to solve all these problems with regard to NATO, EU, US, the Russia relations are very important. He has to decide whether he will be acting together with the Western world as an equal member, of course, not uh, forgetting its own national interest, or Turkey will be sliding to the axis of Russia, uh, China, and Iran. So this is a critical decision. My guess that if Erdogan wins the election, I think he will have a totally different foreign policy uh, structure because he will depend heavily on external uh, actors in economy, finance, foreign policy, investment, tourism, military, in every regard. He has to make a choice. I don't think Turkey can sit where it is and interact at the same level as it does now with the whole world. That's the ideal situation, if you ask me, because Turkey is a European nation, it's an Asian nation, Black Sea, Mediterranean nation, Caucasian nation, and the Balkan nation at the same time. So it can bridge the gaps between different parties in the world. Uh, however, I think if he wants more economic aid, he wants more investment, he wants more military cooperation, there will be huge pressure on him from the West to make clear decisions about China, Russia, and Iran. And it is going to be difficult, both for Erdogan, if he gets elected, uh, and also Kılıçdaroğlu, if uh, he wins the election as expected. I mean, many people expect widely that there will be a change after 20 years, no matter whether opposition is competent enough to handle all these challenges, but they want to have a change and open the way so that uh, Turkey will be moving its natural course. Perhaps there will be another elections in two years' time. This might be just the election uh, to achieve the transition smoothly from 20 years of Erdogan era uh, to a new era that Turkey requires and deserves. And, uh, but I think, as I said, whoever wins, Erdogan or Kılıçdaroğlu, will have to tackle these tough challenges because Erdogan also has been following election economics, handing out you know, uh, increases in uh, salaries, and handing out the very early age, uh, retirement age uh, to many beneficiaries. Whereas in France, we saw that there were protests mm -hmm. uh, for increasing the retirement age from 62 to 64. Whereas in Turkey now, with this early retirement scheme, it comes down to 45 years. So an economy like Turkey's cannot afford that. But for the election politics, he has to do this. He has to uh, hand out more and more benefits to people so that they will vote for him. But there is a fatigue with Erdogan, I must say this. He also seems to have some health issues uh, when he speaks, when he talks, and when he walks. It's not like the Erdogan that we know, very dynamic, energetic. He would never look at the prompter and just talk his mind is sincerely. This is what people like. But this is changing. So uh, whoever wins, as I said, there has to be transformational change uh, in many ways. So the West in that regard, and also other allies in the East, I think should help Turkey in this transitional period, because earthquake made things even worse. Well, and where is religion standing uh, on this, uh, um, everything you explain? Because, um, as I said earlier, uh, Ataturk transformed uh, Turkey in a secular uh, country, but Erdogan is trying to bring back religion at the level of politics, a different transformation, an opposite transformation to what Ataturk has done. You said that uh, whoever wins the election will have to transform Turkey or, or one way or another. Will uh, Turkey accept religion at the level of politics? I think the Atatürk uh, revolutions, especially with regard to secularism, has been very strong in Turkish politics and among the values that generations learn. 
Therefore, it's not easy to turn Turkey into a theocratic state like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, or wherever. And uh, so, yes, true, since Erdogan came to power, initially, actually, he was very liberal, as you know, democratic in many regards, the first two terms. Then the religion started to come to the fore in his third term and fourth term. Even within his party, I don't think that they are all religious. They all want the Sharia state or anything else. Perhaps there is a core group of, let's say, 10, 12 percent, which might require, which might desire that. But Erdogan is a clever and pragmatic leader. But he is also pious. You know, he's a religious person. He, he sincerely believes in uh, his own religion. But I think uh, he stayed enough in power to understand that the religious uh, convictions, beliefs cannot be imposed on the state, because state is free of any religion, and it's the personal. Uh, domain of uh, anybody in the religion, whatever religion they are practicing it. But you are right, Turkey has, unfortunately, a, a used the religion somehow and the government bureaucracy for appointments. If you look at all the cabinet ministers right now or the key portfolios, they are all graduates of Imam Hatip's, mm -hmm. the religious schools. School, yes. And so there's a tendency towards overemphasizing the role of uh, religion, as well as the religious people in government, and also change of uh, wealth to more religious people. And this shows that there is sort of, sort of a salami tactics, gradually, without uh, alarming the rest of the population, and he wants to use uh, religion more and more. But I don't think it will go to the extent that Turkey will become a Sharia-ruled state. So. And also, who will come after Erdogan is important, because he's not immortal. And uh, if uh, something happens to him health-wise, or he loses the election, who is the next leader of AKP? When they ask me these questions in the West, I say he's number one, and the next person is the number six. So uh, therefore, it's quite difficult to replace Erdogan. So if he disappears from the political scene, I think uh, AKP will also gradually disappear because it's a party, it's a coalition of different religious groups, different interests, different uh, political, religious, and economic groups, interests. On uh, his side, Kemal Kulic Daroglu uh, promised that if he wins election, he will bring Turkey closer and will improve the relationship with the European Union. Is that easy to repair uh, a relationship like Turkey has now with the European Union? I think, again, there is a, a need to revisit Turkish accession into EU. Because if we have a referendum today, in EU member countries, because EU constitution requires that, I don't think that they will allow Turkey in, no matter who is in power, no matter how democratic credentials have improved, no matter how they collaborate in NATO and otherwise. My suggestion all along has been that let's put the accession uh, discussion on the hold in the refrigerators without losing the Aki communitaire that Turkey acquired, and but focus on a win-win new partnership in which you will have free movement of people, in which you will have modernization of customs union, in which you will discuss also how migration will be handled, and also energy, climate change, tourism, investment. If we are going to witness um, a change of power in Ankara, if Kılıç Daroglu wins the election and becomes the new president of Turkey, how will be the relationship with uh, Turkey's partners from the Middle East and uh, with Russia? Erdogan has personalized foreign policy. There's a special chemistry between Putin and Erdogan. I don't think Kılıç Daroğlu can have a similar level of relationship. Uh, so the right thing is perhaps to have it uh, between the institutions. But unfortunately, in Russia, it's the personality Putin called that matters. So if we don't have a good relations with him, things might really flare up. And we will have serious tensions, as we had before. You remember, Turkey shot down in, the, in NATO's history for the first time a Russian uh, fighter on the uh, Syrian border. 
So we might have similar crisis with Russia, and Turkey might be coming back to more NATO, EU, US aligned uh, strategy. But he might also, depending on who will be in charge of foreign policy and security, he might also manage this uh, with help from his team. And uh, with the Middle East, I think Kristarolu has a, a, a proposal on the table, creating a OSCE type of uh, security and cooperation and development mechanism in the Middle East. But definitely, he will be normalizing relations with Syria in order to solve the problems with the refugees as well. And I think he has to continue uh, the improvement in relations with Israel, Greece, uh, Gulf countries, Iran and have a healthy win-win relations with China and uh, other powers. So I think this is Turkey's strength, whoever comes to power, to play a multidimensional policy without sticking to one line of uh, alliance only, because Turkey hasn't benefited much from uh, association with EU or NATO in terms of security and economic prosperity. Therefore, it has to seek its interest wherever it is available, but as a responsible and trusted partner without changing according to the winds uh, blowing in every direction. So, but we should always remember that, and uh, no matter how much we criticize Turkey for its democracy backsliding, economic mismanagement, and what you have, Turkey is the largest and strongest power uh, to reckon with in a geography extending from China to Germany, from Russia to Saudi Arabia. Therefore, as you said in the beginning, whatever happens in Turkey, will significantly impact all others. So we are watching the elections, therefore, with this call in mind. Atât pentru astăzi, dar rămânem în continuare online pe pagina de Facebook a emisiunii și pe contul nostru de Twitter. Revenim cu subiecte noi din lumea diplomației și a politicii externe, vinerea viitoare de la 11.30 și reloare sâmbătă după miezul nopții. La revedere!